Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. The goal of this segment is to take the first steps toward mastery of the fundamental energetics, the so-called thermodynamics of all of life, and in particular of biochemistry. So remember what we said, biochemistry is kind of the, the glue, the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle that unifies the inorganic world with all of the biological world. It's like the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle. What we're concerned with here is what happens and what doesn't happen in the biochemical domain. And thermodynamics determines what will happen and what won't happen. But let me emphasize that the same rules that govern the ultramicroscopic molecular processes that we're interested in in biochemistry also govern the macroscopic processes that we experience with our senses so that our intuition about thermodynamics it can be extraordinarily useful. So let's begin with our intuition from macroscopic experience and then talk about how we apply it specifically and quantitatively to biochemical reactions, the things that will be our primary concern here. So let me begin with two sort of things that you can easily grasp. Imagine you strike a match to a piece of newsprint and you allow it to burn. What are you experiencing? You feel the heat coming off of that reaction. It's releasing a lot of energy. Suppose you try to pump the energy back in now and run that reaction backwards. Does it work? I'm sure you know that it does not. So there's the reaction that precedes the burning of the paper, not the unburning of the paper, but the burning of the paper releases heat energy, but the heat energy that's released is somehow not the whole story. There's something more that we need to understand. Let me show you a second macroscopic analogy which will help you understand what that missing piece is. Imagine you have two cups, and you drop one from a low altitude, and it fractures cleanly in two pieces. But now you have a second cup, and you perhaps throw it harder or uh, drop it from higher altitude, it breaks in dozens of pieces. Now put glue around the surfaces of the break and put the, the two-piece cup into a cloth bag and give it a shake. And maybe give it another shake. And then ask, how likely are those two pieces to accidentally come back together and reform the cup? The answer is not likely, but it will happen at an appreciable rate. It will happen. On the other hand, the cup broken into dozens of pieces, no matter how long you, you shake the bag, you're never going to reassemble that cup by the random process of shaking the bag. We'll come back later to how you might reassemble that cup. That'll be interesting, but that's not our subject right now. So from these two reactions, these two macroscopic experiences that we easily understand intuitively, we get the feeling that there are two separate things involved. One is heat. We experience that from the burning of the paper. And the other has something to do with order. So if you start with a cup broken in only two pieces, reassembling it into a more orderly, complete cup is unlikely, but but will happen. On the other hand, if you shatter it into dozens of pieces, the likelihood that it will reassemble that disorderly array, reassemble into an orderly uh, uh, intact cup, extremely small. So there's something about heat energy and something about order. We, we understand that from our macroscopic experience. That is exactly true and exactly as applicable to individual molecules undergoing the biochemical reactions that will continue to interest us throughout our journey as it is, again, about the, in the macroscopic case. So again, we're concerned with how these laws apply to what will happen and won't happen in biochemistry. So what we want to begin with is a specific quantitative treatment of this subject. This will be a little abstract for a couple of minutes. It'll be kind of algebra and mathematics. But as you'll see, the simple equations that result from this are incredibly powerful tools to understanding and predicting what will happen in biochemical reactions. And remember, your goal is mastery. And if you can understand and predict, you have mastered. So being able to use the, the simple equations that we'll derive in the next few minutes uh, and use them efficiently and effectively as we're going to help you do will be an incredibly powerful tool in moving forward. So here is the fundamental equation ar around which all of thermodynamics, in particular chemical thermodynamics, and more particularly biochemical thermodynamics revolves. This is the so-called Gibbs-Helmholtz equation. And let's look at, it look at it, its elements. First, note that each piece is a delta. In other words, this equation is talking about change in. So when we burned the newspaper, there was a change in the elements of this equation in ways that we'll talk about in the next few minutes. Or when we reassembled the cup from its pieces, there was a change in this, these uh, elements of energy. We're going to be concerned with how those, what those are and how they work. So the first one, delta G, is named in honor of J. Wallard Gibbs, the developer of chemical thermodynamics. And it refers to the overall change in energy of the system. So for example, if we took the two pieces of the cup and reassembled into a, into a 
uh, a cup, a complete cup, there was a change in free energy associated with that system. If we burn a piece of newspaper, there's a dramatic change in free energy associated with that reaction. So understanding what will happen and what won't happen is about understanding the free energy of the process and how that changes as the process unfolds. So the elements uh, you know, that gives free energy is the sum of these two elements that we talked about, order and thermal or heat energy. And reactions will proceed w when they release energy into the, into the world. So negative delta G means the reaction will proceed. That's easy to remember. Uh, negative delta G would be associated with uh, the release of energy into the world with the burning of the newspaper, for example. So if you just think of the burning of the newspaper, it's very easy to remember the sign convention here. If the reaction proceeds with release of energy into the external world, that reaction will proceed spontaneously. We can make that statement more precisely in a few minutes, but that's a very useful way to begin. Let's now look at how the components of uh, Gibbs free energy give us this heat and order component that we experience from our macroscopic uh, examples. So delta H is the abbreviation for what's called enthalpy, and to a first approximation, that technical term refers to the heat of the reaction. So in general, you can measure enthalpy change by measuring the heat that a reaction either absorbs from its surroundings as it goes, or releases, in the case of the burning newspaper, to its surrounding as it goes. You can measure delta H enthalpy change. So spontaneous reactions usually are associated with a negative delta H. That is, the newspaper lost uh, enthalpic energy stored as chemical energy as heat energy into the environment, producing the heat we experience as it burn, for example. So the, from the newspaper's point of view, there's a loss of enthalpy, loss of heat energy into the surrounding environment. That contributes to a negative delta G. But notice that there's a second term that we'll come to here in just a moment, minus T delta S. So when we say that the that reactions that proceed usually release energy into the surrounding world again, like the burning newspaper, we mean that that's usually true. But once in a while, the second term, this delta S term that we'll come to in just a moment, can dominate the reaction. And you can actually have a reaction that proceeds while absorbing energy, heat energy, from the surrounding. That's unusual, but it absolutely happens. And we'll talk about that uh, as well. So the Next element is just temperature and the convention here, the constants that are used in cal doing these calculations assume absolute uh, uh, temperature, that is, uh, uh, where zero is absolute zero. This is the so-called Kelvin scale scale that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And this is our last term, uh, this sort of slightly mysterious and very interesting term called entropy, delta S. So spontaneous reactions uh, usually go in the direction that produces what? Negative delta G. And since this is a negative term, they will normally produce a large delta S. That is a large increase in entropy. And entropy is, a, you have to remember the convention, entropy is a, is a negative quality. It's a disorder. So think of the cup, for example. The, the intact cup had one level of entropy. When we smashed it into dozens of pieces, its entropy increased. Its disorder increased. So think of breaking a cup as increase in entropy, mnemonic, a useful mnemonic device. Okay, so this en entropy term is slightly mysterious. Can we understand what it is? Well, we can understand it as a, a, in a physical chemical sense, uh, where S is the uh, can be measured by, uh, uh, as the Boltzmann constant, a particular uh, uh, thermodynamic constant. Details need not concern us here. Times the times the natural logarithm of the number of all possible states of the system in question. As a practical matter, and I'm sure as you can imagine, we can almost never measure such a thing. We almost never have any idea what that number is. So in point of fact, we're almost always going to be measuring entropy change, not absolute entropy. But as you'll see, that's quite sufficient to do almost all the things that we want to do. And I'll show you in the sample problems that we're going to solve at the end of this little segment, I'll show you an example of how we go about doing that. It's actually quite simple to do uh, once you understand the underlying principles. OK, so we have this fundamental equation, the uh, Gibbs-Helmholtz equation, that explains the, in the abstract, in mathematical sense, what processes will occur and won't occur. Let's take a step closer now to actually applying this to biochemical reactions and improving our intuition about what's actually going on here. So the f the, let's sum up what we said before we take that step. So endergonic reactions are reactions in which the system in question absorbs energy Gibbs free energy from its surroundings. That is, it. Either <laughs>